black girl Celtic. Y'all better talk back to me. How are we doing today? Yay! Yay! All right. Let's all take a collective breath together in through the nose and out through the mouth. One more time in through the nose and out through the mouth. Welcome. Okay. Hello, my name is Ian Fields Stewart. I'm today's moderator. My pronouns are they, them, she, her. And um, I'm going to ask everyone today uh, to say their name, their pronouns, and then I'm also going to ask them to name a black queer person, um, living or dead, or black queer people, who we would like to hold space for today and like bring into the room with us. So um, after we share that, just take a moment to sort of breathe in their names, and breathe them out. Cool? So I'll model it for us. My name is Ian Fields Stewart, they, them, she, her. She, her. And uh, the person I would like to hold in the room today is Faye's Elizabeth Day Latif White. Thank you for that. Hi, uh, my name is Michael R. Jackson. My pronouns are he, him, his. And the person I would like to hold space for um, is uh, Darius Marcel Smith. I'm Daniel Love. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I would like to hold space for Sylvester. Hi, my name is Dia Johnson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and uh, Elder, I'd like to hold space for is Reginald Shaw. Hi, my name is Sarah Traber. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I would like to bring Lorraine Hansen. that, thank you for breathing life into those people and bringing them into the space with us today. Um, so my, we're just gonna jump right into the question. It's gonna be really light, very breezy. You know, we're talking about black girls in the American theater, so obviously it's gonna be a very easy conversation. <laughs> Nothing is gonna be very complicated about it. It's just gonna, you know, just happen, right? Okay, cool. Um, so, um, for, my, for the group, uh, intersectionality right now is kind of a buzzword, but I am interested in how existing <coughs> at the intersection of blackness and queerness contributes to the, to the development of your unique artistic voice. Once again, light, breezy. <laughs> Just sit back, you know what? Don't think too hard. Repetition works so well for me. Uh, <laughs> could you read it one more time? Absolutely. I will read it as many times as you want, Donnie. Thank you. Intersectionality is something of a buzzword these days. <laughs> but I am interested in how existing at the intersection of blackness and queerness contributes to the, to the development of your unique artistic voice. <laughs> Y'all got these ahead of time. Come on. Yes, we are. Make me send them. Don't act like we got these ahead of time. It feels so good to get you thinking. Mm. Um, I'm going to start with you. For me, so, like, I always sort of remind people I'm from, I was born to a black family. I grew up in a black city in Detroit, Michigan. I went to black schools, I went to black churches. The first boys I kissed were black. The first boys I did anything else with were black. <laughs> so like everything about my sort of default um, consciousness is black and queer. And so when I like began writing stories and poems and so forth as like a kid, like that was always where I was coming from in, in, the, in the stories that I was telling. And so like, it never felt unusual to me until like people would like, well, like, until like I ended up having to be in spaces that were whiter, where suddenly my default consciousness was like somewhat in question. Like I remember this one experience I had when I was studying playwriting as an undergrad in Reeves like 20 years ago. And I was taking a master class with Kenneth Lonergan and he, brought in two actors to read all of all, everyone in the class's plays, like 10 minutes of their plays. And so he brought in, it wasn't these actors, but he, it was a, like he brought in Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. Like, <laughs> it was like he brought those actors in to read our uh -huh. scenes. And I had written this scene that was like this old black Southern couple who were like yes. in Detroit 
like having an argument. Oh, and I had to and I had to listen to Adam Driver <laughs> read that back to me and like listen to them like, and I wrote it like in di like in the dialect these characters spoke. And I had to listen to Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson read that to me, which because I have like a dark sense of humor, like I like it was amusing to me, but it was, like, <laughs> but it was also just like my first time of being like, oh, I see. My default is not your default, mm. and I. But I also could feel the room being like, including him, not knowing, because this is pre any language, intersectionality wasn't even thought of in as a popular concept. Concept, like I could feel everyone like going, something is wrong. <laughs> I don't know what it is, <laughs> and like, and, and we couldn't even talk about it. Huh. Yeah. And so, like, they read it. He, I couldn't really get any feedback on my play, which to be clear, like my play was not good. But like my not good play couldn't even get feedback yeah. because of the sort of the clash of the defaults. Mm -hmm. And like and I and I left the that experience. Clash of the defaults. Sorry, yeah. you have to kick that out. Yeah. Clash of the defaults. And so and I like, take that with you. Take it home. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just left that experience like sort of knowing, you know, like that that just was just that was a reality of the time, at least, and maybe it still is, but like, but it didn't change what I was doing, but it like, it, and I think it just, it was a reminder to me to just like double down on my own sort of consciousness and the default that I was in. So that's the best way I can answer that question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who else would like to answer that question, if at all? I so when I think about uh, intersection, when I think about intersectionality, naturally, right, like identities come to mind, and I learned of my identities um, for better, more so in this context, for worse. Um, being in spaces that I thought were supposed to be safe spaces. Um, so being in, just like you, my entire experience up until a certain point was all black everything. And being in these all black spaces, I learned of my queerness. And I learned of, in order to survive, I need to, um, as much as possible, hide my queerness. When I think about being uh, HIV positive, I think about being in queer spaces and how I'm, this is something I can't share with anybody. This is something that I can't share with my um, queer family because I may be looked at as an outsider, I may be looked at as a pariah. Um, so for me, it's this very unique relationship. The spaces that are supposed to be these safe spaces for other identities, they are actually, they can be dangerous spaces. Mm -hmm. So like, figuring out how to navigate what that is and what does that look like. Um, there are moments where um, still, as it relates to my status, I don't share in certain spaces. Um, where, okay, do I want to share this thing? Do I want to say this? Um, or do I keep this thing to myself? Um, and so it's like always this very interesting thing of like what does it look like to be in a space where you see yourself reflected so much, but at the same time, it can be dangerous. And I think that's the thing for me that I most often think about, and that constantly finds itself like into not just uh, my work, but just how I navigate life in my everyday existence. It's so interesting that you were saying that, because as, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, I was paying attention and mm -hmm. thinking about, um, <laughs> I was thinking about sort of how in, in looking at one and two fireflies, and um, Sugar in Our Wounds, if y'all don't know these plays, learn them. Uh, um, and pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> and pay to see them, and pay to produce them. Yeah. 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 The produce uh, part, so, yes. yeah. uh, But just being like, something that seems to weave all of this together is sort of this idea of disclosure, right? It's sort of this idea of like, what is kept secret? What is disclosed? And it's something I would never have like, thought about until you spoke about it in that specific way, but how disclosure really is affecting and like, intricately weaving through, like, even when you're dealing with characters that aren't necessarily, black, like, queer, mm -hmm. but that are still navigating how, like, there's just a certain under, deeper understanding of what it means 
how black people, uh, black queer people understand disclosure, mm -hmm. invisibility, right? Yeah. And like, yeah. Making a choice, like I think about um, before, like really standing firm in my uh, queerness, thinking about uh, family members. Oh, is this your friend? You know damn well, <laughs> this ain't my friend. <laughs> this is my boo thing. Um, but just Spoiler like, alert, it's never the friend. It's never <laughs> the friend. So, so just think about like language, right? And how language is used to um, not so much protect. <laughs> that way that's 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 deep. Right, that's like, deep. like yeah. not, not so much to protect, um, but in a way, like perpetuate this like, being delusional, like mm -hmm. not wanting to like right. call a thing a thing, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. not wanting to call a thing a thing. No yeah, call like a thing. You know, catch it, catch it, catch it. It's like not a thing. Um, yeah, but wanting to be a <laughs> friend, <laughs> <laughs> that's a friend, but just wanting that's to cool. like be saved, right? So this is how we'll label. This is what we'll call yeah. this thing. Um, Donnie just gave y'all a hashtag, hashtag that ain't your friend. Like, the jersey, y'all. Get these up, we just got started. The jersey, y'all. You know how that goes. Did anyone else want to respond to that question? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what I love about what you said so far is how much the work triangulates through the experience. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, you know, that I have found that my, my voice as a writer is closest to my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. the things that I'm Similarly, I grew up in a world that was de facto black and de facto beautiful for that reason. Um, and then so much of my life has been such a complicated journey. Like growing up in the South, growing up in New Orleans, which is a city that has an identity that is constantly shifting and constantly loving, but also constantly violent. And people mm. like, which one is true? I don't know. We don't talk about the past here. Strange. <laughs> um, but also,
Um, and, and yet, I was born fundamentally with such a, a clear sense of self. Example, uh, somewhere between the ages of four and six years old, I wrote a rap mm -hmm. called, Hey Mama, You Don't Understand, it's a black bag. Period. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a tape recording of it. Um, and, and then my mother moved me away from my home in, in uh, the Bay Area to a rural white town where I lived for 10 years trying to figure out what the happened. And from the vantage point of a six and seven year old, right? So me coming back to myself is sort of like my lifelong journey. So mm -hmm. coming out as queer as one does, like as they develop in their age, you know, I mean, I was like, had a foot on the fence and I like eight, nine, 10, and was like middle school, da, 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 but like, that was like, oh, I, I'm queer, I'm queer, and they're like, oh, I'm black, I'm black, and like, so the, the unity of my queerness and blackness is me coming back to the sense of self that I had from the beginning in, in, uh, in spite of the world around spite of like the literal visual uh, landscape that I was living in, which was white, 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 and rural, and all these things. Not that rural can't be black, but like as in, it was me in the trees trying to like figure out mm. what the hell was going on. Y'all in the trees, come on. Y'all in the trees, come on, y'all. Come out the trees. They'll lead you back. And so I had to write myself into existence, as we say here, because there was, I didn't have a youth group, I didn't have like, Peers that were like, I mean, I, you know, I found a little outsider plan when I was like five years or whatever, but you know, I didn't have representation of self. I literally wrote it, and that's what kept me alive. And and so this unity of like, the more I am united with a sense of self that makes sense, um, it is blacker and it is queerer, and and I'm writing it and writing it and writing it. We love to see it. Come on, yeah. we do. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start out with. Um, we're going to go down the line to sort of ask individual questions. So I'm going to start with Mr. Michael. Um, in so much of your work, like comedy and drama are inextricably linked. Um, if you are not um, aware of Michael's uh, work, you need to be aware of A Strange Loop. It is currently available on all streaming platforms. I ask you all to join me in my personal mission to make uh, A Strange Loop the top streamed Broadway musical, musical theater album. Yes. Yes. Not get out of the way. So like, I ask you to join my campaign. It's a one woman campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, you know, come through. Um, but uh, so, so, but your work like always, always seems to combine like, with comedy and drama, and they're sort of inextricably linked. And um, and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm just interested in sort of what is the the very particular experience of generating theatrical comedy from the black queer perspective, and like meaning specifically that I think that we've been offered many things about like you know what it means to sort of have like some dark Irish humor, or like you know like or things that are called like black humor, which interesting. Um, and so I'm interested sort of in hearing from you about like what it, what how you are sort of like generating that from your particular black queer perspective. Um, I mean, I guess to me, comedy, the kind of comedy that I like the most is the comedy that is just that's truthful. Like it's saying like the true thing, you know. And like, and I find that just in like the the kind of humor I'm drawn to in life is just like things that like really sort of expose us for who we are and our frailty and our contradictions and our, you know, our good, our bad, you know, all, all of it. And, and so, you know, being like a black queer man, like I've had to deal with a lot of things in life where, you know, I was either made fun of or like I, you know, I was, you know, coping in a certain way. And like, it was from that sort of feeling of constriction as, as a younger person that I was able to sort of find the humor in it and like find, figure out what was ridiculous about it or what was painful about it. And then just sort of pop, like if it's a balloon, just keep popping it. And I find that like humor is the thing that really invites audiences in that makes you lean forward and it's like it, you can like really form a, a sort of a bond with an audience through humor and so it's just always been like a tool that I turn to and my sort of identity is sort of like linked to that because there's just so, so many things that are absurd 
about how I have to navigate the world as a black queer person. And so I just sort of take the power to myself in the work that I create in doing that. I love that. I, but I, and I also want to, um, in a moment of just celebrating and standing over you, um, I just really want to celebrate that, like, I feel like something that's very unique about that perspective, because I feel like many people attempt to sort of like use comedy, just as you were saying, use comedy as that bond with the audience, yet when like we place diff like bodies that aren't cis, hetero, white on stage, those, the, the bond that's created is something of like, it's almost done around pity. And I think the fact that you were able to put so many black gay men and this beautiful, gorgeous um, black trans woman on stage, you still surrounded by comedy and allow it to not only like bond them with the audience, but never apologize for that bonding, I think was such a gift that I, is, is why I'm, you know, part of my one woman campaign. <laughs> and we all joined today. Um, and so I just, I really, have to, I have to like honor and uplift you for that work because that is a very special and unique um, gift to have. So I want to celebrate you for that. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Snap away, snap away. If I can say snap. one thing about that is like, and that for me was like that, I guess also like I don't see a separation between sort of like my work and life. Mm -hmm. And it's because to me theater is a reflection of what's happening and so the, those bodies on that stage were people who I was very much in collaboration mm -hmm. with, who were people who were in my life, who were in my community. And so when it, and everything, and they, everything that's like on that stage also is, it's yes, I wrote it, but it's also because they are in it. Mm -hmm. And they have been in this community of people telling this story for so many years. And like, it, it, like the line between, between a strange loop and like a strange life mm. yeah. is, is <laughs> nearly invisible, you know what I mean? And so, and I, you know, I feel like I, I wanna foster that, the, that kind of community and whatever piece I'm writing because ultimately we're all sort of, bond, we're all collaborating together to tell a story to an audience and so, and to, and to like show something of life back to, the, to life. You know? So, and when you put a mirror to a mirror, what do you get? A strange loop. Go! 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 Uh, which is um, sort of looking at between Sugar in Our Wounds, Fireflies, and One and Two. Um, your work to me feels part sort of black imagination and part archival. Mm -hmm. And if you agree with that assessment, I'm just wondering, you know, what role does preservation play in your artistic process? Um, come to a question. You know? <laughs> come to a question. I, I did. Oh, it's like um, I know what I'm doing. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I agree. Um, and so I remember with your other question, uh, talking about existing on this very um, specific intersection and in spaces where uh, one would think that you would feel safe, uh, you don't. And so existing on this very specific intersection um, gives you such a unique perspective um, of life and how to, um, how to not just tell stories, but how to navigate, how to survive. And I remember with uh, Sugar in Our Wounds, um, I was just thinking about uh, black queerness and enslavement, and why did I never imagine myself and individuals who love like me mm. existing during that time. Um, Can you provide a little bit of context about what Sugar in Our Wounds is about? So Sugar in Our Wounds them. is a, a play that explores um, love between two enslaved men. And I was very interested, I was very passionate about what does this love look like between these two enslaved people. Mm -hmm. um, not seeing um, uh, this uh, white man find uh, an attraction or love uh, within this uh, enslaved man, within this black man, but what does it look like 
for two individuals uh, to find themselves in each other? And like, what does that look like? And when I started to think about that, the imagination part started to chime in where the very first time I sat down to write the play, a tree started talking. And I was like, what in the, <laughs> and I was like, just lean into it, <laughs> the tree probably won't be in other drafts, um, but just lean into this thing, um, and the tree, the tree said, look, I will not be moved. <laughs> I will not be moved, y'all, take okay. it, take it. But, but then I just started to think about uh, how these two go together, right, with um, like archiving history and just history and imagination, and they are one and the same, because when I started to think about the tree, I started to think about how we as black people have such a unique relationship with trees mm -hmm. in America, right? Mm -hmm. Like we literally, the lake, the lake. we cannot um, uh, uh, like extract that at all, we cannot make that up, it, it literally is what it is. <laughs> so what does it look like to have this tree um, who has um, held the lives who uh, was a part of taking the lives of uh, this young man. And all of these individuals in this tree are also um, men um, in this young man's life and affirming um, who this young man is, saying, I see what you are uh, experiencing and what you're experiencing is love. And when I was thinking about one and two, I came from a very personal space and I also came from a space of never seeing myself as a black, queer, HIV positive person reflected um, on the screen, reflected on the stage. Um, and I've said this and I'll say it time and time again, I truly believe that if with Angels in America, with the normal heart, um, I'll even say with the inheritance, um, if there were, particularly with uh, the first two that I uh, shared, because uh, they existed at a, a time that uh, predated me, uh, if there were individuals um, in those plays that looked like me, I do not know if I would be HIV positive. Mm -hmm. And I say that to say reflection and representation is such a real thing. I think about the campaigns that happened um, when HIV and AIDS uh, first came onto the scene and every single photo that you saw were of white queer men. So the programming is, oh, as a white gay man, this is my disease. I have to take the steps. I have to uh, protect myself. And so for individuals who weren't white and who weren't gay, the programming is in a very subconscious way, oh, I don't have to worry about that. Like, I'm not as important. It is okay. And then we get to a place where one in 11 white gay men will contract HIV in their lifetime, be diagnosed, versus one in two for black gay men. So thinking about all of those things and like how all of those things are a factor, what can I do? Um, with the gift that I was given to be able to tell this story and to be able to not just think about the past, but to use um, imagination as well. And for me, imagination is also rooted in joy. Mm -hmm. And how can we be able to use joy in our imagination to tell stories? Thank you for that. And also, um, if you did not see one and two at Signature Theater, you're living a lesser life, but it's okay. You know, you can find it somewhere. You can just encourage them to eat juice again. Come on now. You know, just saying. Um, but like, yeah, I, what, what, I'm, what I'm also thinking out of this is not just that black folks need to be hanging out with trees more, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but also that like, what I'm sort of thinking uh, out of this is sort of the, the beauty of black imagination. Like, I think when we talk about imagination, we often think of it as make believe, but seeing black imagination in an archival sense as, um, a, as sort of like a retelling of truth mm -hmm. in a way of like truth that we, that we, that were never documented, mm -hmm. but to go back and sort of say, you know, why couldn't this have happened? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't this have been our truth? And that and that's sort of serving to like carve ourselves, like tell our, to write ourselves into our own history. And so I just that's always something I've seen in your work and really appreciate it. So I just wanted to uplift yeah. that. Yeah, and if I can just really quickly like uh, two people, two things come to mind. One, Octavia Butler comes to mind, and like the way she was able to just imagine um, what a black future looks like 
was so, I've, I've never experienced anything like that in my entire life, and it, it, it was so liberating to be able to, to imagine uh, blackness um, in the future, to imagine black queerness into the future, to imagine what it means to be black queer, HIV positive in the future. I think about that, and then I also think about um, an emergent strategy. Adrienne Marie Brown, the author of the book, an amazing book, um, she talks about imagination and like what uh, what is imagination and how imagination can be used for joy, can be used for um, resistance, and then also if in the wrong hands, imagination can be dangerous, yeah. right? And thinking about uh, white imagination and what white imagination did to people like um, Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. did to people like Tamir Rice, did to people like Sandra Bland. White imagination became this very dangerous and violent thing. And so for me, I'm very rooted in how to use imagination, again, as joy, as resistance, as hope, as the future. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Stan, I'm going to move on to you, my love. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also running a little bit close on time, yes. just kind of uh, making note of that in the space. Uh, so what is your opinion of the representation? Oh, no, stop that. Oh, girl. <laughs> you won't get, you won't come it lied to me. It lied to me. See how they try to zoo you, but they can't keep a bad bitch down. Go on. <laughs> so, focus, uh, what is your opinion of the representation of black queer women in the contemporary American theater? I'm also interested in your feelings about the symbiotic or not relationship between black queer women and black queer men in the American theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, the representation of black queer women in the American theater is uh, abysmal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Agreed. And it's not for lack of artists creating, it's mm -hmm. for lack of artists being valued and produced, um, and for their stories being valued and produced. Um, you know, I am sitting on the stage right now for a play that I wrote by a black queer 16 year old girl, and that is a big deal, mm -hmm. and I do not take it lightly. Um, because I know so many wonderful black queer women make somebody go, oh, there are other stories to be told. Oh, we should pay attention. I hope, you know? And I think it's sad for me for a lot of reasons, but I think the main reason um, is that representation is everything. It is all that there is. Um, I think that like there is so much that we can dream up all on our own. And there are certain things that we literally can't see if somebody doesn't tell us it's possible. Mm -hmm. And it breaks my heart often that I feel like sometimes early on with my work, I would get people would say things to me like, "Oh my God, beautiful, beautiful play. This is the best play I've ever done." Blah 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 blah. blah. And I'd be like, "Are you going to produce it?" Like, "Oh, well, we don't know." <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? And like that is not me being like, "Whoa, it's me." Nobody wanted to produce CA. I don't think that way. I would go. What is happening? What is the space between that this is wonderful and oh, I don't know. Yeah. And that space is about value. Mm. That space is about who gets to decide what matters and what should be seen. Mm. And I mean, I think that a lot of times, like we all know that this theater, is, most theaters are predominantly white institutions and predominantly white spaces. And so it's already hard for any artist of color to try to get in there in any kind but when those spaces are also predominantly male, it's even harder for any woman to get in that space. And then you have a white woman here, and you have women of color here, and you have queer women of color like way down here somewhere being like, yo, 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 <laughs> and then being like, who are you? Um, I think it's a problem, and I think it's it's sad that I had to dig as hard as I did for Elsie, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, And I know that they're out there and their work just faded. Mm. That's right. You know, there's Lorraine, but even the play of hers that we herald is not the one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There is, um, I remember somebody handed me, she liked Girls by Chesa Hutchinson, and I was like, she like what? <laughs> <laughs> Who now? And I read that, and I was like, okay, that can exist. And I was like, okay, that can exist. I could write something. You know, in the way that I've had to piece together an idea of queerness, like a, like a woman's queerness on stage by reading like other women. You know, I had to like find Lisa Crone and five lesbian brothers I had to find. I remember the most beautiful moment I had in the theater was at a reading at New Year's Theater Workshop. 
um, where they were doing the table read of How to Catch Creation by Christina Anderson, and mm. she invited me to listen to it, and I sat in the room and I cried. Mm. Because it was the first time that I'd seen me, but really, it was the first time I'd seen my desire on stage. Mm. And for me, I know that my way in to telling my stories is about dreams, too. It's about imagining what else is there, but it is also about being honest about the fact that I am a woman who desires one that Mm. And I get to say that. Yes. Mm. And I get to dramatize it, and I get to say, hey, are you uncomfortable? Good. I'm not. <laughs> Let's move on. Yes. And I think that until we get comfortable, like, one, with the fact that black people desire, yep. and that the desire is Ooh. not deviant, mm. but also that so many different kinds of black people desire, and that kids need to see that they are allowed to want and to need. Um, it matters. It just matters, and it is really, really, really sad to me that we haven't gotten to the place where we recognize that full scale. Mm. Um, I think that like some of my first and most formed relationships in the theater have been with Black Virgin. Like I literally have always called Donnie my brother. Mm -hmm. Like we got the same fellowship the same mm -hmm. year. I worked with weirdly in conversation. <laughs> we would eat cupcakes and be like, yeah. my God. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, our, Michael had the same thing. We had a fellowship together and I was like, what are you writing? Like, oh. You know what I mean? It's family, no question. Mm -hmm. And I never feel, I think what's symbiotic about it is that we can see one another's work and go, yes. Mm. And I think what's problematic about it is that we can see one another's work and go, yes, and be fully supportive of one another, and then the institution pits mm -hmm. us against one another. Mm -hmm. Which is actually not what we are doing, mm -hmm. it's what the institution is doing to us. Mm -hmm. Like, it should not be impossible for me to be in season with one of these men. Mm -hmm. But the chances of that happening, slim to none. Because the slide is one slide. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, for me, that is actually not about us, because we got us. That is about the powers that be. Yeah. Yeah. I really want to thank you for that answer because I think that um, within like queer um, and like the LGBTQ alphabet gang member of the city, whatever, it's gonna be, like, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to call it, like there's, I think there's a lot of narrative about like sort of like tensions and animosity that exist between like queer men and queer women, and I think there's also a specific lens that we as like Black queer people have that maybe like others don't. Um, I say maybe, but um, you know. Uh, I think that that's just a really important thing to pull out, is that it's like, it's not that this is like a natural thing, like, oh, men and women just can't get along. <laughs> no, it's like, but it's, it's it, that there is an institutional divide that occurs between us. Um, uh, so I want to hand it over to you, my love, and I want to ask you, um, there's a narrative that exists that as like black artists, we're interested in addressing the racism in theater. Um, one of the best ways is to fight, is to change the system from within. And so um, as like the lead community artist in residence, Lincoln Center Education, I'm just wondering if you agree with this narrative. I'm gonna be honest with you, when I read this question, my first response was to be angry. Mm -hmm. Not because you wrote it and you sent it to me, but because it's triggering. Yeah. <laughs> because no, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not no as in like one should not, you know, attempt to ask the system to change or to get inside and da-da-da, but like I quit arts administration hard to. Um, and what I have to tell people who are asking to, you know, you know, how do I get to where you are? Or what you know, what can I do? Da-da-da, I have to tell people you have to be okay with fighting for your bread every single day. You have to be okay with explaining yourself every mm -hmm. single day. You have to be okay with advocating for everybody around you who is a little bit other every single day. That's not the same thing as making it necessarily your mission to change the system. That's just showing up to work. Mm -hmm. That's just showing up. And so it's not a question of, is that the best place to go? Should you make, should you put on the cape? Now, the cape is put on you regardless if you're gonna show up, right? So in, you know, when, when I was asked four years ago if I wanted to uh, do some, some of my artwork under the umbrella of Lincoln Center Education, I was like, are there deliverables? Can I call it a residency? Can I do what I want to do here? Can I work the way I want to work with people I want to work with? And the, just by the face of who, who I was talking to in that moment or whatever, the answer could be yes. And so I could move forward and continue to carve out and try to make something that was mine and, and precious and I could protect and could be like a little bit funded in the way that I want it to be. But I'm not trying to transform the entire institution. That's another project. That's somebody else's job. And 
I, I once thought that that had to be my job, but that was just me contending with the pressure of trying to show up for work mm -hmm. and thinking that I had to make it better for everyone just to be there. Mm -hmm. And I've just gotten to the point where it's like, I know that I have to be fierce and ferocious to hold my boundaries to get what I need and to bring in the collaborators I want to bring, but that's as far as my advocacy has to go, or I will lose myself, I'll lose my heart, I will not be an artist anymore. I will just be, I mean, that's, and that's another cost, right? Like some people want to do that, and that's great, but you have to know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I, I want to be an artist. Yeah. And if you want to be an artist, the answer is absolutely not. Yeah. That's what I think about, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, we are, um, we are reaching the end of our time, but before we go, I'm just going to push a little bit. Um, they're going to get mad at me, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> but so I, want, I want to just go, uh, the last question I was going to ask um, that you, I welcome all of you to ask is yourselves and others bef um, before you leave today, which is like, you know, as you have all gained access in your career and experienced some level of commercial success, have you found it easier or harder to work with other queer, black queer artists, why or why not? Um, I'm not going to ask that in the space today because all of you have to answer and be beautiful answers. Um, but I want you all to consider that question as you leave today and about like what it takes to make sure that we are working amongst each other and with each other and arm in arm and holding space for each other. Um, but what I would like us to do, just sort of as we did at the top, I'd like us to go down and just name um, various, uh, either various or just like one or two black queer artists that we are currently, like that we love working with, that are our collaborators, so that we're naming as many people as possible. Folks, take out your pens and your papers, yeah. write everything down, make sure you pay these people, send them Venmos, cash out, <laughs> or just go see their work, whichever you prefer. Um, I will start, I'm gonna give a shout out to my lovely, these two lovely people right here, Malik and Nyla, who are both artists I've worked with, also did Shade up there, all incredible, oh, right here, hello, like, oh, raise your hand if you know me, come on, raise your hand. <laughs> all four of these wonderful people, make sure to talk to them after the show, they all have cash apps, organizations, and plays that need producing and writing. They need, they need the money, they need the time, they need the energy and the resources, give it to them, they're all beautiful, I trust each and every one of them with the work. Next. Um, I'm really enjoying a new collaboration with uh, Liliana Blaine Cruz, um, mm. and a mm. continuing collaboration with Raja Sando Kelly. Mm. Those were incredible artists in human. Um, these people up here, um, uh, people who you listed as well, I'll throw in uh, Jordan Cooper, Stevie yeah. Walker Webb, Sahin Mali. Shameless plug, I'm trying to find my Gladys Bentley right now, who is a figure in black queer history that we need to lift up. So I am looking for the brilliant, masculine, black, fat singer that you have dreamed of your whole life. If you know them, let me know. And I'm looking for her right now. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you all for coming to the theater today. Um, all these artists that were just named that are existing in this space right now, if anyone ever tells you, I just don't know where to find anyone, they lie in. They're right here. Thank yeah. you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.